This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs the Playbook. I have the incredible founder and chief executive officer of Suffolk, John Fish. Welcome to the playbook. David, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Well, there's nobody to me that I've had on the playbook that is more aligned with my mission of making a lot of money to help a lot of people and, of course, have a lot of fun. And the reason I focus in on these three things is I've never met one person on earth that makes a lot of money to help a lot of people and has a lot of fun that isn't happy. Uh, and I learned this uh, from someone very special to me, my mom. And she kept everything simple in my life. Always do your best, learn lessons, have fun, make money to help people and have fun. Everything was have fun at the end. Uh, but yet, you know, no one's had more influence or impact on me and all the billionaires, millionaires and entrepreneurs, celebrities and athletes and entertainers, ironically, than my 79 year old mom. For you, I know you're aligned with this philosophy. Where did you derive the character and discipline and perspective that has allowed you to be so abundant and help so many charities? You know, I often say is that to whom much is given, much is expected. And when you sort of take a step back and my upbringing really defined me. And I also think leadership uh, really is, is defined by your upbringing as well. It's almost like a theory of Darwinism. Uh, you, you are a product of your environment. And I grew up and I tell people very proudly, you know, I was a severe dyslexic and, and I didn't learn to read until ninth grade. I can't spell past third grade and you could never read my handwriting. But my family, my mom, you know, was at my side the whole time supporting me. And eventually I went on to high school and I read a, a, you know, a person in the Marine Corps who was a teacher of mine, a football coach. And he taught me that even though I was good, you know, in the football field, I, I didn't need to be stupid in the athletic in, in the classroom. And so what happened was, is that he helped me sort of got the support I needed to learn to read, to learn to, to spell somewhat, uh, you know, uh, phonetically and to get along in, in school. And as a result of that, in my hard work and perseverance, I was able to graduate, you know, close to top of my class in prep school, a place called Tabor Academy, and then move on to a wonderful school called Bowdoin College. And the reason I went to Bowdoin College, which is a very competitive school, it was the only school in the country back then, Dave, that didn't require SAT scores. I got twin 400s. And if it wasn't for my athleticism, I say that humbly, uh, coupled with my drive, I never would have attended Bowdoin. And when I went to Bowdoin, what I did get, you see, I got a good athletic career, but more importantly, I really learned how to read and write and, 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 and work with people in a very, very thoughtful way. So to me, at the end of the day, you know, I'm similar to yourself is that, you know, people around me uh, helped me be what I am today. And, you know, again, it's all relative, but I have a deep, deep responsibility of helping the next generation be what they can be, because I wouldn't be here with you today if it wasn't that case. I love that. And that desire to be what you must be is the common denominator of all what I call people who carry the spirit of excellence. And you work within the realm of, of real estate. Uh, you have this and be are the chair of the real estate roundtables, board of directors. And uh, even as a lawyer myself, I've my dad was a commercial broker who went to law school himself. And I find it extremely valuable to understand real estate, even if you don't want to invest in it. Uh, and the reason I find it so fascinating is that all of the laws that our country was uh, based on, the, the, the laws that, that, believe it or not, were the original uh, purpose behind America was to protect the landowner. It was something that was very curious. And from its inception, it's very important to understand the significance of real estate in the American dream. Yeah. Uh, and I, whether it's asset-based lending, Airbnb, VRBO, short-term real estate, or huge, you know, mega billion dollar buildings and projects that I've worked on, it's amazing because at its core, it's the American dream. And you really have hosted and led America's, you know, top publicly and privately, you know, held leaders of, initiating and creating uh, the platform or, you know, the reality of today's real estate. And it's so important to every issue in America. For you, how did you build that skill and knowledge base in order to encompass being the chair of this board of directors of something so important in America? Yeah, let me say this first. First, I'd like to say it's an honor and privilege to be the chair of the Real Estate Roundtable, along with the president, Jeff DeBoer, 
it's got a history uh, of, of really, I think, you know, credibility, uh, thoughtfulness, uh, you know, policy uh, direction in Washington. And I think it's very, very well respected universally. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think what drove me to that is our industry is a very unique industry, as you pointed out. When you think about it, real estate from an investment point of view, real estate in the long run, I don't think in any category round you could get a better return if you look at it decade over decade. The challenge with real estate, it deals in cycles. And if you're in for the short run, you could potentially get hurt, like most developers do if they're in and out of the market. But if you stay there for a long extended period of time, your year over year, decade over decade growth, I don't think there's any other asset class that returns the way that real estate does. And also, David, what I would say with real estate, there's a deep, deep sense of pride owning a physical asset, how you care for it, how it shows up, how your tenants occupy that space and enjoy their existence in that particular structure as a whole. So to me, having the opportunity to invest in real estate, which I do, to design real estate, which we do, to build real estate, what we do, and we use technology and data to support that, which is a little bit unique and different, okay, gives me a very, very well-rounded perspective of the category and equally importantly, how can I give back to that particular category? And how can I learn from the people that have been there for decades over decades? And how can I share those experiences, again, as I pointed out before, with the next generation of leaders in the real estate category? And you bring up a great point about real estate beyond it uh, and its capabilities as an asset uh, with the laws in America and the trends of our historical financial position in America, it is year over year in the long run, you know, a great easy to understand asset that, uh, you know, you can't borrow against any other asset like you can real estate, you know, it, it's so secure in its nature, that where else can you put down, you know, zero to 20% and be able to go ahead then and borrow against unfound uh, uh, valuation, but more importantly, is it's one of the few areas in business in America that mentorship is still so pertinent and available. And what I mean by that, John, is that you and I are a little bit longer in the tooth and experience. We've been around the block a few times with the, several businesses, but if someone came to us about NFTs, we could only be as knowledgeable about NFTs as a 19 year old. Um, and so the mentorship capability in NFTs limits me. I can give basic business principles of timing and risk tolerance and other things that you and I have learned by going to good schools and uh, paying the dummy tax. But more importantly, real estate is something that I'm so surprised people can go back and find someone that has 30, 40 years of experience in the exact same asset class and really can give you directions very quickly how to get to where they are and yet so many people are afraid to ask, what are some of the mentoring capabilities that you have both in uh, your professional position, but also in the charitable initiatives that you do? Yeah, I think it's an interesting conversation. I think when you unpack real estate, David, what I often people think don't really sort of realize early on in their careers is that when you approach real estate, I often encourage young people to learn the construction side of the business. When you think about a pro forma, which, you know, and you get total development cost, 70% of that pro forma is hard cost, the bricks and mortar. Only 30% of that is soft cost, architectural fees, carry cost, legal fees, and so forth. But most developers, when they're young, they don't understand the 70% of that pro forma, and they rely on third parties. And if you rely on third parties when you're young and you don't have an aptitude there, you better ensure that you can count on those particular third parties. But quite often, you can't. So therefore, a lot of young people that get involved in real estate without having a construction background, sometimes, not all the time, get themselves into trouble. And it's very easy, as you well know, especially when it cycles, when the interest rates climbing, inflation moving in, a, in the wrong direction, all of a sudden, you can get caught pretty quickly. And in, in real estate, cash is king. And people that are undercapitalized really don't have the staying power. So as I often say to people, if you're going to be successful in real estate, approach it, okay, from a long-term perspective, take your time in educating yourself in all facets of it as much as you possibly can, and have a sense of humility, because realizing the industry is changing relatively quickly, and the dynamics that go into under underwriting projects is also very, very fluid and dynamic at the end of the day. So you need to be very cautious. 
But to me, a lot of people, I think, once they get involved in real estate and stay in real estate, it's for one particular reason. Well, it should be two particular reasons. One, they're passionate about it. Like you, when you talk to real estate, I could see you smile. Okay. And second off, you enjoy getting up every day and doing what you're doing. And you meet some fascinating people, all walks of life. And secondly, if you do your job, you cross your T's and you, cry, and, and, and you dot your I's, you can make a hell of a living at the end of the day. And what I often call people, it's the old fashioned way. It's like one brick at a time. And I often remind people when we think about back in World War II, David, is that what built America? Okay. After World War II. It was a construction real estate industry, and it's always hovered around four to five to six percent of GDP. Okay, and that impact on GDP, I would argue, is the most significant impact of any aspect of GDP because when you think about it, we build these buildings in the urban core, right? They open up shops and restaurants. They hire, you know, sort of working class people, right? The service oriented economy. Those people save money and then they spend their money, and that drives consumption in America. So at the end of the day, we are as category, one of the most influential, I think, uh, industries that affects almost all aspects of people's lives. And I would say to you very humbly, I'm very, very proud of it. Yeah, and beyond that, you know, most people don't see the construction industry and the 12 billion or so in business that you do as being a people business, right? You talk about 70% being hard costs and how construction works. But I can't think, as I've been educated and experienced in construction and, and development, that I can't think of a business that's more people above all else. Uh, it is one of the most people intensive businesses and people reliant businesses. And you're, you and your company have some great core values that make it a non-negotiable of something that I believe in, which is be kind to your future self by doing good deeds. How important are the people behind the construction in all your years of doing business? David, it's an excellent question. And thank you for asking that. What I would say to you is I often say to people with respect is that we don't build buildings for a living. We build people. And the people happen to build the buildings. And what I often find out, it's culture that drives that experience at the end of the day. And I, when I did a little homework on yourself and you talk about gratitude, empathy, accountability, and communication, you think about that lens that you look at people through. And at the end of the day, as you get a load like you and I, you really want to work with people you like, okay? And you can get along with. There's always reasons to find excuses or problems in the real estate construction industry. It happens all the day. But do you like and can you cut trust the people that you're currently doing business with? And to me, as I've got a little older, that's one of the sort of the filters that I've used. And it's been, you know, I would say, you know, relatively successful because if the people you're working with are not fun to work with, they don't think similarly to you do from, 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 from an integrity point of view, the, out, out, the ultimate you know, outcome is not something that you're typically proud of at the end of the day. And to me, I get up every morning very, very early, about 3.30. I love going to work. I enjoy it every, every minute of it. But I enjoy meeting people. I, and I enjoy dealing with people. And most importantly, what I like about people, David, like yourself when I was reading about you, we all have experiences in life, okay? And I often say to people, you know, as a human being, all of us have a sense of dysfunctionality. All our families are somewhat dysfunctional. If you really told the truth, you know, to be very candid with you. But we're all just trying to get along. And what we all do as a human race is we learn more from failure than we do successes. You and I expect ourselves to be successful. So we don't, we're disappointed. And, you know, I remember my successes, but I have much greater instincts, okay, and in, in, in focus on my failures because at the end of the day, you and I both don't like to fail, but unfortunately, different different points of time it happens. But we become better people as a result of that if we do it with a sense of humility and a sense of understanding. It's always about how do we continuously improve and improve the world that we're in. Because at the end of the day, we're both very very lucky people, and and I say that very very humbly. And we do share a lot of the same philosophies uh, and theories in life, and one of them is a campaign, a branding campaign that I'm on. We all know the Dos Equis man, the world's most interesting man. Yep. And I love to find people like John Fish, who I call the world's most interested man. In fact, I dream, I tell my wife of a commercial someday about myself. I tell her humbly, I said, if I could have a commercial one time that said, you know, Dave Meltzer once asked a hundred open-ended questions just to figure out how he could be of service or value to his community. That would be, to me, like 
the ultimate commercial. You know, I dreamed about being, you know, Bo Nose commercial or the Michael Jordan commercial. Now I want to be the antithesis of the world's most interesting man and be the world's most interested man. But in order to do so, we have to have curiosity. And I see you as someone that has an endless curiosity to be more interested. How important is that curiosity in the humble success that you've had? Yeah, David, it's, it, it's, it's a, I think, almost, uh, I would say, a hallmark of, of who I am, and I'll explain to you why. Again, when you're in a situation where you're born with a, as a severe dyslexic and you've struggled your whole life and, you, you know, you, you have trouble reading and, and, and writing and spelling and people make a lot of fun of you. But as you get older and you're no longer taking tests in class and going to the chalkboard and people can't write your handwriting, you all of a sudden have a detailed appreciation for learning. And to me, I, I love learning. And I learned sort of, uh, sort of differently than a lot of other people out there. They call them learning differences. And I learned by having conversations, you know, sitting in different meetings, exposing myself to different types of categories outside of construction. You know, that's why you know, I, I, I chair the board of Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston. I'm on the MGB board. You know, I chair the board of Boston College. I didn't go to Boston College. I chaired the Federal Reserve. And I often remind people the Federal Reserve was probably the most, most fascinating boards that I ever served on in my life to learn about monetary and fiscal policy and especially applying those principles to what's going on today with quantitative easing and all these other things. So to me, I, I think my life each and every day is an opportunity to go in the world of the classroom. Okay, and, and, and open my aperture up and take advantage of it as much as I possibly can. But David, that said, how do I share those kernels of information that I learn and digest with the next generation? And I, I say this respectfully because I really believe it's incumbent upon ourselves to do everything we possibly can to provide service to the, to the next generation. The reason being, because our generation in America, I'm 62 years old, is the first generation in our history is leaving our world worse off than we entered into it. And I take that extremely seriously from a climate change point of view, from a geopolitical point of view, uh, from a healthcare perspective, and a social unrest point of view. So to me, how do we encourage people to have those thoughtful debates without being sort of fearful that what you say is going to be held against you, but people honestly debate with them, how do we make this country that is the best country in the world, the United States of America, the country that we once knew. And I'm a firm believer that I really believe carrying that sort of message as much as I possibly can, not Democrat, not Republican, okay, but just pure American and be proud of that. And just to bring this home, I want to start where, I want to finish where we started, which I said the common denominator of all people who carry a spirit of excellence is this idea of we must be what we can be to enjoy the consistent every day persistent without quit, pursuit of our own potential. And I know you being a college athlete, I know I humbly make fun of myself as my biggest uh, accomplishment or the closest I've come to my potential is to be an average division three football player at Occidental College. Um, and, but it was uh, something potential wise that I came very close to my energetic and genetic inheritance. I, I gave everything I had to find a way to do and be my best at maybe something I wasn't born to be the best at, but I gave everything to be my best. And you seem to be a find a way person um, and a find the way company. And you carry it over into all the boards and the charities uh, that you are involved with to not only find a way for yourself, but empower other people to find a way uh, with faith that we're being promoted and protected by the setbacks, failures, and mistakes that we make, not punished. For you, what is that core perspective of being able to be an optimist and not only for yourself, but helping others find a way? You know, it's, it, it comes back to the too much is given, much is expected. And I've been in a situation where, you know, I've been exposed to a variety of different things uh, that in creature comforts that you know, I never thought I would be able to deserve. In my opportunity, how can I bestow those gifts on other people? And I'm at the time in my life right now where it makes me feel good and healthy inside to help others help themselves. And as we all know, that's not always the case in America today or in the world. And so to me, how do I give back to the precious individuals that are out there that David really and truly need that type of support? And whether it's not the easiest thing as you and I both know is write a check. 
but how do we spend the time with those individuals? You know, when I was doing some homework on yourself, and I, and I said this really with the admiration, you know, when you think about David Meltzer, that in Yiddish is, is, is beloved servant, okay, when you think about it. And I was really, really sort of struck by that. And when I read your story and I saw how the different sort of, you know, decades you've lived and what you've accomplished in thinking of really the beloved spirit, it really speaks volumes of not just about who you are, but what we should be as a, as a society, okay? We should be a beloved servant. We should be at the service of others. I'll, I'll close by saying this to you, David, as I chair the board of Boston College, which I did not go to. I'm on my second term there, so six years. And I'm the first non-grad to be the chair of Boston College. And Boston College is about men and women for others. And, and, and yes, it is about Catholicism, but it's more about Jesuit philosophy, Jesuit tradition, and men and women for others. How do we give back to the underprivileged, underserved? How do we understand how fortunate we are for all the great things that people have given us and that we work for? And how do we share those things, okay, with others that are less fortunate than ourselves? And I think if we could turn away from the politics and back to the essence and core of what human beings are all about, we're just human beings. And the interesting thing about human beings, David, they all need food, water, shelter. But they only want one thing. Every human being on this planet, 7 billion people, they just want to be loved by one person. That's it. There isn't a person on this planet by one single person. And if they feel that they aren't loved by that one person, Dave, what happens is they lose hope, they lose purpose, and they end up in the street. Okay, And that's really, in the 21st century, not appropriate. And it shouldn't ever exist. And I think you and I and the rest of our country have a responsibility to help those people because they're not bad people. They have mental illness and they need our support. And that's what we're here for, to support the underprivileged, underserved. Well, I'll tell you this, John, I can't think of a better person to lead us on so many different boards, both professionally and philanthropically. The things that you're doing and the philosophy of elevating others to elevate yourself from one beloved servant to the other. This is David Meltzer with John Fish.